I want to be completely honest here. I thought of this video as a joke. Like, I was just sitting down in the shower one night and thought to myself, Haha, it would be really funny algorithm bait to make a war crimes and Undertale video, but... The more I sat down and thought about it, the more I realized it's actually a genuinely good idea. And now we're here, I guess. You know what? I ask myself that question every single day, bud. It's hard being the sole producer of hit videos like the war crimes in the Pokedex or the OSHA violations of Aperture Science and not have a few regrets along the line. So while we're going through this harmless tutorial, I'm just going to go ahead and get the usual preamble out of the way. Uh, did the monsters and humans sign the Geneva Convention? Probably not. Does the Geneva Convention even exist in this world? I also don't really think so. That being said, if the Red Cross can get away with ignoring the entire basis of war crimes existing for a campaign, then I should be able to, too. Plus, I feel like this is going to be about ten times more educational than that, so I think I'm overall producing a net positive to society here. Anyway, this is Undertale, so really any crack pipe theory you could possibly conceive is probably on the lower end of the conspiracy spectrum. With all that said and done, though, I think. Fuck! You know what, this is actually an extremely good first encounter to set up the tone of the game and the video. So, firstly, I need to cover something that pretty much every enemy in this game is potentially guilty of. Attempting to kill a potentially harmless child. Killing a kid isn't strictly a war crime if the kid in question is a child soldier. However, unlike future enemies that may have the right to detain or even neutralize you because you're a threat or show aggressive behavior, Flowey just instantly attempts to kill you, and that's a massive no-no. Of course, at some point or another, we're going to have to cover the game's routes and their impacts on child slaughter, but I'm going to do that after the ruins for reasons I'm going to get into later. Secondly, by luring the player into believing that these very harmful bullets are harmless and even beneficial, I'm going to go ahead and say that counts as an illegal act of deception. Especially so since the player character isn't a combatant, meaning this is a malicious and targeted attack against a civilian, which is extra illegal. Also on that note, I wouldn't necessarily call Flowey himself a trap, but the fact that he's a flower and the bullets have a petal-like appearance there's the case to be made of this being an illegal booby trap under the definition of, quote, any material which is constructed or adapted to kill or injure unexpectedly when a person disturbs or approaches an apparently harmless object or performs an apparently safe act. A particularly unfun fact about that, actually, there's a lot of things you can't design a booby trap around and some of the most malicious and harmful design candidates out there are items that are specifically designed for children since they're some of the most affected by mines and traps during and even after wars. Yeah. On a last note, I don't know what the hell the bullets are made out of, but judging by the fact that Flowey is a literal goddamn flower and that his attacks are plant-ish, at the very least, plant-like. If these are petals, there's also a case to be made for biological weaponry, but that one is definitely more of a stretch. So, all in all, this is one of the most malicious entities I've ever had to discuss on this channel, and it's a fucking flower you encounter a few seconds after starting a game. What a damn start. Anyways, Toriel here, being an individual who understands basic laws and morals, does what any rational person should do in this case. Guide the child to a safe location. Granted, she does a pretty shit job at this, as she does leave you behind in an area with lots of potentially dangerous monsters lurking around, but that does give us an opportunity to talk about the random encounters here. 
But not before our video sponsor, Raid Shadow. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I swear to God, that was a prank. I literally sent over an, e e an email to their representatives detailing how I need at least 70 grand up front because a meteor crash landed into my house and lit my cat on fire. I promise, I'm not. Uh, well, let's talk about Winson. He's too sensitive to fight, and you can see that in his attacks, as they literally can't hit you unless you intentionally run into them. This, when combined with his extremely apologetic attitude, makes him innocent in my eyes. Especially since you can spare him without having to act whatsoever, so he genuinely just doesn't want to be there. This is unremarkable, but I wanted to bring it up because there's quite a few instances in this game where attacks will always miss the player unless they deliberately run into them. So, from here on out, if there's an enemy that can only damage you if you intentionally run into shit, I'm not going to count that against them. Children will always find new and inventive ways to commit suicide, and especially with human children being a very rare sight in the underground, I'm not going to fault the monsters for the lack of kid-proofing. Honestly though, quite a lot of encounters in the ruins share a similar thematic where most of them don't explicitly want to hurt you. But they do have attacks that can and will damage you. Potentially lethally. With two maybe-ish exceptions with Vegetoid and Looks. Vegetoid reminds you to eat your greens, obviously referring to vegetables, but the conundrum here is that I don't know if the vegetables that aren't green in this attack are, like, colored canonically. Like, everything in the game is colored, but the second you get into a battle, with a few exceptions, everything is black and white. The reason why this matters at all is, just like Flowey, there's a case to be made that this is both an illegal booby trap since you're being guided towards a projectile that doesn't look dangerous, but it could also potentially be labeled as a biological weapon. I mean, the issues remain regardless, but if there's multicolored vegetables, it's going to be a lot harder and maybe even a bit more nefarious. At the end of the day, most problems still persist, but it's a note to look out for. Lux, on the other hand, who, by the way, is canonically named Lux Eyewalker, which would be a goddamn war crime in of itself, is the only enemy here that I'd consider aggressive. That's not to say that other enemies don't attack you, obviously, but if you choose to pick on Lux, his attacks become more and more intense, and you no longer gain the option to spare him. You can still run away, and you can still spare them afterwards if you don't pick on them, so it isn't quite kill or be killed, but it is kind of problematic still. Everything else though, it's pretty one note. Actually, uh, Future Davy coming in, I kind of thought Napstablook was exempt, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the battle isn't as great as I thought it was. Now, to be fair, you have to initiate it by pushing him with force, which is a dick move, but even with that being said, there's a few issues here. Really, it's just that the battle is forced upon you, and is also entirely unnecessary. It's sort of a dick move by the player, but I honestly wouldn't consider it an engagement, because my guy Nappa over here is obviously in the way and is just hoping that you go away in a very unassertive and disruptive fashion. Far more importantly though, and the reason I'm bringing this up at all, is that it is literally impossible for you to kill him since he's an incorporeal ghost. Even during the genocide route, if you show up to his room after exhausting the kill counter, he just disappears before you can attempt to battle him. You pose literally zero threat to him, yet he still attacks you. Granted, in air quotes, and while with other monsters I could somewhat defend their battles as being misguided since they're mortal, and hence likely have self-preservation instincts kicking in with this new, possible threat in their home, Dapstablook just... doesn't. He hasn't even been laying down here long, as Toriel is much further into the ruins than you, and there's only one way to proceed. 
and he can literally fly, so the battle is entirely pointless. This is exceptionally nitpicky, and I can't help but feel for the dude, but I thought I'd bring it up because I knew people were going to comment on it eventually. A anyways, uh, past me, rawr, fuck, I, I can't do transitions. Everything else, though, it's pretty one-note. That is until we get to Toriel, who, honestly, just like all the other enemies, doesn't really have ill intent. In fact, she specifically wants to keep you safe. Her battle is ultimately a test before considering the possibility of letting you out of the ruins. Even in combat, she doesn't want to hurt you, as her attacks do eventually begin to wane if enough time passes or your health becomes low. And in the surprisingly rare case that you do manage to die to her, there's a singular frame where she appears shocked before your soul shatters. Of course, this is practically inviting a hundred I died tutorial comments, but it's genuinely kind of hard to see this because, again, her attacks begin to wane, meaning that you practically have to plan your death in order to see it. But it is a pretty neat tidbit that further reinforces that idea of her testing you. However, unlike other enemies we fought, a tutorial literally gives you a trial by fire. And that's a massive no-no. I've said this over and over and over again, but since people really like to confidently tell me that incendiary weapons are legal to use in war and hence my viewpoints on fire attacks are incorrect, I'm going to take this as an opportunity to point at the hypothetical sign. Incendiary weapons are perfectly legal to use in war but due to their nature of being extremely fucking painful and their prevalent usage throughout all of human history, there are a ton of regulations on how and when you can use them. For example, one of the most common use cases for them is to clear out foliage, whether it be to force an enemy out of a fortified position or to make a potential advance easier. This is a perfectly acceptable tactic. Using them against civilians, say, hypothetically, a child, one that can potentially be unarmed and harmless, mind you, with absolutely no tactical advantages for using fire in particular, is completely fucked and prohibited. Y you don't do that. Bad. However, this is where I can finally circle back to the elephant in the room, and that's the different routes you can pursue in this game. There's pacifism, neutral, and genocide, and I decided to wait until Toriel was over with as I believe the ruins is a good checkpoint to talk about this. Because let's say in a hypothetical situation you decided to kill everyone in the ruins. The only way that word can get out that you're a cold-blooded psychopath is if our favorite or potentially second favorite skeleton boy, Ness, investigates and decides to warn others. Which is... Something he wouldn't do. Snowden will be evacuated if you continue on the genocide route, but I believe it's Alphys who is ordering or leading the evacuation here. There are also spiders that could potentially get word out, but since they can't inhabit or even survive in the tundra of Snowden, word would have to get over by Hotland and eventually make its way back, which isn't impossible or necessarily difficult, but I don't think it's probable. This means that, at least in my opinion, for a little while after Snowden, even if you're a genocidal monster, you probably have a little while to wait before anyone has the right to attack you. In fact, on that note, let's talk about child soldiers real quick. Uh, recruiting or deploying child soldiers is a massive war crime. But in the cases that this was disregarded and they were deployed as combatants, they were killed because ultimately they are still threats to you and the lives of others. The thing that really needs to be highlighted here in particular though is recruiting or deploying. Because ultimately the crime is on the militia that recruits and or fields them not the child or those who have to make the unfortunate decision on how they want to handle the situation. That being said, in a scenario where a kid is an active threat towards the lives of you or others, it wouldn't be a crime to neutralize the threat. 
However, you begin to take into account the neutral route, where there is an incredibly varied amount of conditions and decisions that can range from desperately retaliating against an unjust aggressor out of self-defense, to becoming a genocidal monster that decided to spare Sunderplane in particular for whatever reason, and honestly it could just be this entire legal thing, and I genuinely don't know where or how to draw the line without spending hours upon hours upon hours rationalizing every possible neutral playthrough. However, to go ahead and set a standard, let's say that, in Genocide, after the buffer of the Ruins and a few enemies in Snowden, in fact, maybe even just an enemy in Snowden, everyone has the right to utilize force to detain or potentially even kill you. For a neutral route, though, obviously it depends on the run and the severity of your actions. If you're resorting to murder... a lot the monsters would have the right to deal with you as seen fit. Likewise, it would be an appropriate response if you've murdered innocent monsters, or monsters that have a high rank in the guard, or other similar positions. However, if you've only resorted to murder against enemies that approach you with the malicious intent of, uh, killing you, it would be kind of hard to rationalize that neutralization would be an appropriate response. Then, in pacifism, attacking you is just a straight-up war crime. Full stop. Well, even then, there's exceptions. If you're doing some weirdo pacifism route where you're just beating the fuck out of everyone before sparing them, then it's probably valid. But, like I said, I don't want to turn this video into two hours discussing whether or not you're able to be slaughtered if you hurt a Winsun, so I'm going for generalizations. Pacifism is okay. I mean, I guess there was that one time that YouTube banned my content for promoting a violent terrorist organization, and it was just... pacifism. So maybe the monsters are onto something? I just don't fucking know anymore. Snass and Pappy. They're both okay. In fact, Papyrus is really quite sensible in the fact that his first response is to imprison you instead of attacking you or killing you. I mean, of course he wants to imprison you, so if somebody comes along and kills you, but we'll take what we can get here. Comic antics are going to ensue, so let's just go ahead and move on to the random encounters here, and- Oh god fucking damn it. <laughs> Alright, so let's do this in chunks. Firstly, let's cover all the ice enemies. Namely Ice Cap, Snowdrake, Chilldrake, and Giftrot. Whether warfare or militaristic environmental modification techniques, if you're a Redditor, is a war crime specifically when it causes direct harm or inflicts severe long-term effects to an area. This sounds like some weird sci-fi bullshit, and it kind of is because this prohibition was namely for technologies that could be developed, but strategies utilizing it have been used before. For example, the United States actually utilized this in Vietnam by increasing the amount of rainfall in specific strategic locations to make the terrain much more difficult to traverse, which would consequently make them much more difficult to pass through. The primary objective was to deny enemy supply lines, but it also obviously affected enemy movements as well, which overall made it pretty handy. To tie this back into our snowy friends though, although this isn't inflicting damage to the environment for obvious reasons, the snow and wind hurt. Quite a lot actually. And I mean, to be fair, I actually have to somewhat defend the monsters here, as a lot of the restrictions are based on the understanding that utilizing modification techniques would likely cause harm on a large scale. They're not exactly causing irreversible damage to Snowden and its inhabitants by using snowy attacks in the snowy forest, and I wouldn't consider a child a large scale. 
But even with that being said, it does also prohibit the use of any techniques that would result in damage or injury, and although a child is not a large scale, shoving one inside of a box to dodge a fucking blizzard is kind of damaging. Honestly, this one is kind of literally up in the air, mostly because you can't exactly localize a storm within a few feet, and I feel like if that technology were to somehow be developed, it'd not only be extremely inefficient, but also incredibly cruel. Like, there's a reason a rain cloud over someone's head is a common trope for somebody experiencing depression. It's kind of fucked up, but... I mean, I just see how people would think that calling them war criminals is kind of pedantic. Especially in the case of Childrake, since you need to kill Snowdrake in order to encounter him, but... I could also see why it'd still be prohibited. Mm hmm. Uh, let's just go ahead and put all three of these on a watch list. Uh, note three instead of four, because Giftrot has another funny quirk about him. Uh, one of Giftrot's attacks takes the form of a present, so that's pretty terrible. As I've already mentioned, one of the most malicious things that you can design a weapon around is anything that is closely related to or attracts children. Inevitable YouTuber jokes aside, all I'm saying is that a seven-year-old me would probably sprint through hell and back for one of these damn cartoonishly oversized presents. Anyway, moving past these four idiots, Glide shoots fucking stars at you, and I feel like that would probably be a crime. Stars are kind of hot. Also, when you consider that the only other enemy in the game with star-like projectiles humbly titles themselves as the God of Hyperdeath, I'm gonna say that it's probably a fair assessment. I mean, technically, Night Knight has the sun, which is a star, but you know what I mean. Lastly, all the dogs are more or less fine. Nothing I can find particularly damning about them. They're just doggies. They have little doggy mannerisms. Look at this one. I'm petting him. He's going to the damn moon. It's a doggy. Anyway, let's go ahead and check up on Papyrus. Remember that thing I said about malicious intent? If any of this works as intended, it'd a thousand percent be a war crime. But Papyrus doesn't want to hurt you. In fact, you don't even have to attempt this puzzle, so I think Papyrus is fine for the most part. Well, at the very least until his boss battle. Uh, uh, one question though, uh, real quick, uh, where is he getting all these bones? This isn't, like, an exclusively in-battle thing, either. Even his house just has tons of bones everywhere. I'm not gonna throw out a conspiracy theory that Papyrus is actually a cold-blooded killer that has butchered countless innocent souls so he can use their desecrated remains as a weapon, but... This is just a concerning amount of bones for anyone to have. But luckily, other than that, there's not a lot to hate. And here's something I genuinely didn't know before starting this video. If Papyrus manages to defeat you, he doesn't kill you. Instead, you're placed in his tool shed, or cool shed if you will, and are given a bowl of dry food, a squeaky toy, and an overly small bed. You're technically barred in, but just like the bridge from way earlier, the bars are way too small so you can just... leave if you really want to. Shit, if you manage to lose three times in a row, Papyrus just gives you the option to skip the fight altogether, which... I mean, honestly, the dude's mostly innocent. Granted, he is ultimately attempting to capture you so he can eventually be killed, which is fucked up. Admittedly, I don't think he wants that to happen, but it's ultimately what would happen. And granted, he is harming you in his attempts to capture you, but... 
considering the fact that he heals you afterwards and he's one of the very few characters in this game that you cannot die to, he's kind of leading the charge for ethics and I think that is incredibly fitting considering his character. I'm going to touch up on this more later regarding a future encounter, but uh, he's just a cool dude. I love that. Anyway, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, Undyne. Jesus Christ, Undyne is not happy with her continued existence. On a good note, she is utilizing a spear, which I'm going to go ahead and say is perfectly fine. She does have spears that seem to be made from pure energy as shown in game and in artwork, but honestly I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's a war crime. It doesn't seem to gain any particularly harmful properties other than just being a spear. So, all things considered, I'm going to say that it's fine. As for this level of violence... Not so much. However, for the time being, I want to go ahead and transition into the random encounters of the area and save Undyne for later since she's currently a ruthless murder machine that doesn't require much elaboration. So, to start with Washua, he has a very similar problem to Vegetoid from way earlier. The dude wants to cleanse the world of filth, and because of that, the way to spare him is to ask him to clean you and approach a green water projectile. To be fair, unlike Vegetoid who tells you to eat your greens, there isn't much confusion in what you're supposed to approach, because water isn't typically green. However, on the same note, water isn't typically harmful to the touch. It has the potential to be, don't get me wrong, water jets are extremely powerful, but... Unless somebody decides to point one of those directly at your chest, most of the time you're probably looking at losing a limb at absolute worst. Washua over here on the other hand, yeah, four of these water droplets touching you and you're fucking dead. That's not typical. And another similar problem appears with the soap projectile. Soap isn't exactly a lethal melee weapon, even if you're in prison, so I think this could very potentially mislead a child into killing themselves. Aaron is a... Uh, well, he's Aaron. I feel like we need Chris Hansen in here, because anybody who talks to a child like this should probably be given the death penalty. Maybe that's too extreme, though? I mean, I am closing in on that silver play button, and I've seen what that has done to channels. It's like the One Ring, but instead of bestowing power upon the wearer, it just kind of makes you an awful person. Which is why I'd like to remind you that if you're liking this video, please do not smash that like and subscribe button. I don't want to be conscripted. Do not engage with this video in any capacity. Let it die, and let my channel fade into obscurity. Do you know what makes me even more upset? I've been looking through a lot of a dialogue in the Undertale wiki to make sure that I don't miss anything, and I was looking through Shiren, and I was like, huh, you're more vulnerable to electric attacks. Does Shiren have any electric attacks? I don't remember her having any, but then it hit me just a few minutes ago. It's because you're conducting. You're conducting electricity. I wish to perish. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and cover the rest of the random encounters in the game, as the next few zones are pretty simple, and I don't want to break up the flow of the overall plot and more significant encounters over stuff like... Sunderplay. Like, the Hotlands. Can you guess some of the problems that you may encounter here? Yeah, I don't think I particularly need to elaborate on specifics. As for the core, I think the only real criminal here is Night Knight, who summons the goddamn moon and a meteor shower. Or alternatively, the goddamn sun with accompanying solar flares. Again, I'm gonna cite Glide here and say that burning your enemies with meteors or literal solar flares is a bit much. 
especially since solar flares can act as an EMP since they're literally intense eruptions of electromagnetic radiation. But you know what? It's always just a joy to deploy in the middle of the technology-themed area. I don't see how that could potentially go wrong. Anyway, with all that said and done, after Undyne casually destroys a bridge in order to stop us, we have another boss battle in the form of the Mad Dummy, who seems to be a leader of some variety. We've had enemies with attacks that had other entities in them, sure, but this is the first and as far as I'm aware the only time that you face off against somebody who could potentially be labeled as a commander in battle and they're fully utilizing that position by commanding others to attack you with the intention of killing you. Which... I mean, being a war criminal is already quite bad, but being a war criminal by using others to achieve your goals is... really a lot worse, and the repercussions of this are typically much more dire. Also, I know this is incredibly meta, but the reason for him attacking you depends on how you handle the first dummy in the ruins. Whether you spare it, attack it, flee from it, or even bore it. But regardless of your actions, there is no outcome here to avoid this battle. And with that in mind, I honestly think the dude was just looking for an excuse to attempt to attack and kill you. This one could be debated, it's honestly kind of nitpicky, but those are my thoughts at least. Anyway, as if that isn't bad enough, once you get past all of his attacks, his last resort is to attempt to keep you hostage in this battle forever, which is absolutely a war crime. You may be curious as to why, as we were just talking about Papyrus and I commended his detainment, but here's the thing. I'm not gonna lie, this really isn't a great prison cell. The food is terrible, the bed is way too small, so far, there isn't anything to drink. There aren't any toilets or sinks or anything like that. All you really have is a hard wooden floor to lay on and ponder life. But the fact that Papyrus goes out of his way to bring you to a safe and warm building, away from the cold and bitter environment of Snowden, with food, a bed, and notes that reference how much he genuinely cares for your safety and well-being is really nice. Plus, I'm sure if you asked him to bring you any of those things I just mentioned, he'd be more than happy to oblige. Your cell is right next to his house, and his notes remind you that you can talk to him. For example, I don't really think it'd be too difficult to get some decent food or drink because you're literally right next to Grillby's. And as we all know, skeleton-like Grillby's. With a dummy, though, you're just trapped. With absolutely no sustenance in a cold, dark, wet environment not fit for habitation with a captor who would probably torment you the entire time you're powerless to escape. The conditions are inhumane and would 100% count as a crime. Fortunately for us though, our ghostly pal is here to save us and as always he's just a friend. Not only does he refuse to attack us, but he saves us from a literally heartless jailer. What a fucking legend. Unfortunately for us, though... So, in order to be Undyne, you have to flee from her repeatedly. Continuing to pressure and assault your enemy while they're fleeing isn't a war crime if they don't surrender. In fact, even if the target is a prisoner of war, it's a very extreme measure and it needs to be preceded by appropriate warnings, but it can still be legal as a last resort. Seeing as Undyne gives you a very clear warning, I'm going to go ahead and say that she's in the right in a neutral playthrough. Uh, in pacifism though, it's honestly a bit tricky. I'm going to say that since she's tried to kill you several times before and that you're ultimately still a kid, it's leaning towards the illegal side. But you have ultimately progressed past several armed guards, have been told multiple times to stop progressing through the underground, and yet still seem to be pushing forward despite the warnings. Including the very clear one given before the fight. It's honestly a lot more grave than I initially thought. That being said, though, a lot of this is just thrown out of the window if you ever use the plead option in battle. 
You told Undyne you didn't want to fight, and you told Undyne that you just want to be friends is... a surrender in my eyes, at least. And the fact that option usually does nothing, or at best, only slows down her onslaught is a huge red flag, and is ultimately something that needs to be respected. Fleeing after surrendering is a lot more complicated, but obviously this isn't agreed upon, so it's just a relentless killing at this point. This situation does have a lot of variables, though. Like, another thing I didn't really talk about in depth is that you should lay down your arms if you wish to surrender. Whether or not a fucking stick counts as military equipment is a different discussion. Or whether or not a successful plead followed by surrender could potentially be deceptive, or how the save point spawning before her fight could possibly be a net positive. So instead of going down every single one of these potential factors, let me just list off the total war crime that is our past visit. Our character begins combat by pleading for Undyne to stop attacking them. And when that request is ignored and the aggression still continues, we begin to flee out of desperation. Yet despite not wielding a weapon, showing zero harmful or malicious intent, and specifically stating that we do not want to fight, Undyne still chases us down relentlessly and attempts to kill us. This viciousness will continue until we reach the Hotlands and she faints due to the excessive heat. In order to pursue the true pacifist route, we need to give her water and ensure that she's okay, but our character really has no obligation to do so. In fact, it's really quite a shitty decision, but we do it regardless and only after that she chooses to back away. This took a while, but that's another area down. Afterwards, though, we have Metaton's Bizarre Adventure. Or more realistically, Alphys' Bizarre Character Development. I'll be honest, I really just fucking hate this part of the game. Nothing makes me enjoy a game more than being bombarded with texts and dialogue every .14 seconds while attempting to proceed through an area. I understand that's supposed to be the joke, but it happens at such a frequency that it becomes more of an unfunny annoyance than anything else. Again, I know that's supposed to be part of a joke, but let me complain, damn it. Back on topic though, to be perfectly frank, I'm going to go with cruel and inhuman treatment here. You're getting put into all these extremely messed up scenarios, like a quiz show that prompts a painful electric shock if you choose an incorrect option, or nearly getting killed by a murderous robot with a chainsaw, a weapon that in of itself would probably be considered cruel in war, or being forced to defuse a bunch of IEDs in a short time frame with the threat of dying in a massive explosion being ever looming. And this... Again, it is impossible to fail or die from any of the scenarios, however you're getting put through hell and back just so somebody can pretend to save the day and live through their anime power fantasy. Plus, when combined with things I'm going to get into later, uh, forcing people to go through dreadful and horrific experiences isn't exactly a new thing for either of these characters. And trust me, it's only going to get worse. That being said, as for the scenarios themselves, without the gift of hindsight you can get shocked nearly to death, which isn't great. Then you're almost killed in order to have your remains used as ingredients, which, as we're going to talk about very soon, is a massive violation of treatment and disposal of the dead, and really all the IEDs in general would probably constitute as a war crime. Like this bomb is literally a dog. I have a dog. His name's Bug. Of Bug more than anything. He's my little son. And I get to live the dream that every parent has of monetizing their own children for their own game. On YouTube, mind you. Yet despite everything, Bug has never exploded and caused massive damage. I, I don't think that's going to happen particularly soon either. And I really, really don't think I need to explain why this is terrible again. Anyway, moving past all that, So Sorry is objectively an encounter that exists. 
Uh, to be frank, I don't really care to analyze it. Enough has been said about this bizarre creature, and I feel like time could be spent a lot better. Uh, for example, uh, like talking about why Muffet is an absolute asshole. Firstly is the fact that she's fighting you primarily because she wants money. I mean, she references the fact that you're cruel to spiders, but... Obviously that's untrue, as you can just skip the fight entirely by buying pastries. Even going as far as accusing you of theft if you eat one that you buy from the ruins. You can bribe her to lower her damage in battle, and her dialogue in said battle tells an entirely different story. Firstly, the genocide route, despite Alphys going out of her way to warn Muffet about her imminent death and the evacuation effort, she stayed behind for incredibly vague reasons, and her only regret was not wrapping Alphys up and eating her. Lesbian jokes aside, this perfectly correlates with her dialogue in a pacifist or neutral route, where she claims that she's battling you because she wants to turn you into food, and because somebody put a very large bounty on your head. Ignoring the very feasible mercenary angle of that, this entire battle is just theft. Plain and simple. Technically, theft in of itself isn't a war crime, but assuming there are combatants and non-combatants, stealing personal belongings by force absolutely is. Or more accurately, it can be. Especially since it's driven by greed and personal gain and doubly so since the target is a non-combatant. A trapped non-combatant with no other choice, mind you. Uh, more on that in a second, though. Secondly, in regards to feeding you to her spiders, to go ahead and wrap up that metaton thread I left earlier, that is just a massive violation on the treatment and disposal of the dead. Which is surprisingly something that the underground is really solid at accounting for. Not only do you need to respect the dead and their remains, but you also can't mutilate or despoil them. This is so the dead can properly be identified and accounted for, and to be perfectly honest, the monsters do get a slight pass here as the one time a human corpse has ever been returned, it ended fucking terribly. Actually, a slight pass is rather disingenuous, because the Underground has been extremely good with preserving the dead, with every fallen human being put into a coffin and properly treated for. There are some extremely hefty caveats to that we're going to get into later, but at least for now you still need to give the dead a proper burial or send-off, and getting eaten by a giant cupcake spider or being used for ingredients is not a traditionally viable alternative. Thirdly, back on that trapped note, you're literally stuck in a spider web. I actually wouldn't call the web in of itself a booby trap, as it doesn't harm you in of itself and it doesn't act unexpectedly. I mean, you're literally walking on a spider web. Which means that it entirely escapes the definition of a booby trap but I would consider its usage potentially illegal. It's hard to say anything in a concise, legal manner, but considering the fact that it is a trap and that it's by definition a biological weapon, there's a case to be made that it's illegal in pacifism specifically. That being said, in genocide or even a neutral route, I actually think it's a perfectly acceptable thing to use, since ensnaring somebody isn't a crime whatsoever. But ensnaring an innocent passerby to torment them and rob them of their money? Yeah, it's a little bit more questionable. Lastly, she- uh, god, fuck allergies. My entire face has been burning for like the last three days. Uh, recording audio genuinely hurts, but fuck it, we ball. Anyway, she does also throw croissants and donuts at you, but she does save herself by specifically highlighting the attack before pulling it off. Since it can never be her first attack, and since the sign always correlates with an attack, it's pretty clear that the pastries are weaponized and that you shouldn't attempt to face tank it. If it came without warning, it'd be a different issue altogether, but I think it's actually fine in this case. With all that said and done, though, Muffet was 
not a fantastic person, but trust me when I say it's about to get much worse very quickly. Moving forward to the core, I already mentioned Night Knight, so we don't have to get into the random encounters themselves. But with the Metaton and Alphys storyline, the core and its inhabitants are the first threat so far but have been genuine, with Metaton deploying mercenaries to attempt and kill the protagonist. He also rearranged the layout, which is likely why you have to go through this laser bullshit, which I'm not a fan of. But after all is said and done and we get past all the goons and all the obstacles that were laid before us, we finally confront Metaton and the truth about this adventure is revealed. Afterwards we have a glorious boss battle, which is really fun. It's a boss battle that I really suck at though. I don't know why. I beat Asgore on my first attempt, I beat Sans on my first attempt, I beat Omega Flyley on my first attempt, I beat Undyne the Undying on my second attempt, but base Metaton? I think that took me like four or five tries, which is really bizarre. I just can't get the hang of this mechanic, I don't know. Back on topic though, this battle is a lot less fun when you realize that it's a murderous robot attempting to kill a child on live television for the prospect of fame. Obviously Desecration of the Dead comes up again as Metaton is intending on stealing your soul for himself, but... Again, for all intents and purposes, you're getting killed on live stream for... For the views, I love child murder. I'm such a Sagittarius. I know it's a really weird line to draw in the sand, but I genuinely don't know how much I can talk about this, as this has been an incredibly controversial subject with the rise of social media. As in, not even a year ago, the entire internet, as we know it, was in danger because Sissy Backwards uploaded footage of a terrorist attack online and the victim's family pushed to hold social media liable for having algorithms which promoted it, and subsequently could have potentially aided international terrorism. The Supreme Court did unanimously decide that there was no need to weigh on it then, but I think you could see the potential parallels that I'm trying to draw here, and why I'd overall just like to avoid it. Not because I'm a content creator, like, I am a Zoomer, and I am, by definition, a content creator. And even I think social media has just been a complete deficit on society as a whole. But if my channel is deleted, or YouTube is otherwise thrown out the window, I would really appreciate it if my last words weren't about a sexy robot man and his sexy legs and his real-world implications with the Middle East. So, uh, all in all, we're just gonna go with violence to life. It's really fucked. After this fight and a pseudo cutscene of sorts, we have our next boss battle with the man himself, Asgore, who goes ahead and smashes that mercy button almost as hard as YouTubers want you to smash your subscribe buttons. Uh, is Asgore conscripting me into a child soldier? I have to do some reading. Children who have not attained the age of 15 shall not be allowed to take part in hostilities. I mean, Asgore isn't really giving me a choice here, but a lot of protocols also specify that the parties to the conflict can't recruit children into their armed forces, but I'm not being forced to fight for Asgore. I'm being forced to fight Asgore. I mean, I believe the answer to that initial question is still a yes, since I'm still being forced to take part in hostilities, but my brain is really struggling here. Like, the Geneva Convention hasn't really accounted for some warlord recruiting a bunch of children to fight for their cause just to immediately declare them an enemy and begin fighting them. It's like elementary school PE class and it's dodgeball day. Then, all of a sudden, the PE teacher who assigned the teams joins the losing team, and Dark Souls music just starts blaring. 
none of this is really relevant or even insightful. At this point, I'm just spouting nonsense because the only other thing that Asgore does is spread more fire than a United States gender reveal party, and I'm stalling because I'm really not anticipating what comes after. You know what? I don't even really want to do a voiceover here. In fact, I haven't even scripted this part out. And I'm up to this point in editing. So I, I guess I'm just going to do a sick montage to the music and leave a short descriptor on why it's a war crime and come back in a few minutes. Uh, have fun.
uh, did you guys have fun? Anyways, afterwards, we make the incredibly dumb decision to spare Flowey, as we want to go ahead and pursue the pacifism route. Of course, to do so, we have to do some comic antics, which range in intensity, but ultimately are mostly harmless. Then, we have Alphys. The amalgamates and the entire plotline with the human souls I skipped over to talk about here. I'm getting a drink of fucking water real quick. Oh. God. So, when it comes to experimentation, one misconception I see regularly that I want to just go ahead and clear up immediately is that, even with consent, it is prohibited to carry out certain experiments. Now, granted, I'm not going to pretend that a lot of the most powerful countries in the world don't just blatantly ignore human research ethics. I mean, I live in goddamn America. But, there's a list of things that you just can't do, and I will concede that I'm not very knowledgeable on the International Code of Medical Ethics, but... I'd say, even with consent, resurrecting dead citizens into a perpetually melting abomination that fused with other dead citizens who are also perpetually melting abominations, then refusing to tell the families of those who donated their loved ones about the fact that their loved ones are now horrifying melting amalgamations, despite promising them that their loved one's ashes would be returned for a burial, and even being contacted repeatedly to ask about the state of that promise. Yeah, uh, no, fuck that. Uh, th look at this. Look at this thing. This is irrefutably a crime against humanity. Or rather, a crime against monsters. Actually, miraculously, it's a crime against both. Crimes against everyone. Right now, Elphys is on par with this thing, and... Come to think of it, Alphys literally created Flally, so, so far up to, like, crimes against the universe? I don't know. Is it evident that I'm losing my fucking mind? Because I am. I, I guess I get to talk about those caveats I mentioned when talking about the fallen humans. So on a really good note, the bodies are preserved, which is lovely. On the other hand, though, their souls were extracted from their bodies and kept in tanks to be used for later, where Asgore would absorb them to become a god and wage war against humanity. Which means, to some extent, the remains were experimented on after death, including their souls as determination was extracted from it. And I have to be honest, since souls are at least vaguely sentient and conscious, that only makes this even more fucked up. Because, obviously, at this point, you'd make the seventh and last soul required to break the barrier, which would mean that the souls prior to yours have been experimented on and kept in their weakened and vulnerable state for an untold amount of time, which... I mean, I'd just describe as torture, really. And not like the torture where you're getting strapped to a chair and getting your kneecaps bonked, so... You can tell the people where you left the item or whatever. No, you're just, like, kept on the precipice of death, but just not quite able to die. They're edging your soul from true death, and I'll be frank, I don't know how the fuck I feel about that, because I don't think the Undertale Afterlife will ever be properly elaborated upon unless Deltarune gets absolutely fucking insane. It's absolutely deprivation of liberty. It's definitely torture. It's definitely illegal. I don't really know. It's fucked. I don't know the full extent of it. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind I missed a lot in this brief synopsis. Truthfully, I think we've power leveled our way straight to crimes against reality somehow, but don't you fucking worry, it's only going to get worse. I love it. I, I just fucking love it when I engage a boss battle in glorious combat, and before the fight even begins, the boss has already committed mass genocide against an entire species. He also just devoured all the human souls, but frankly, we've, we've gone past that point by now. 
I just want to get off Mr. Bones' wild ride. Where do I even begin? God of hyper death. God of fucking hyper death. No. No, I'm done. I'm done with this damn route. I'm done with this damn recording. Get me out. I don't care. What do you want me to say? Oh, you can't blast children with the fucking sun. I already said that. I don't know what I'm supposed to elaborate on. Frankly, my job could be done with a fucking artificial intelligence at this point. You know what, chat GPT. Hello, yes, you. Uh, do I have to make an account? God fucking, I'm not, I'm not committed to the bit. I'm just not. So I, I went through Bing instead. Firstly, they're saying that genocide isn't a war crime, which is extremely progressive, but wrong. Uh, and its source was a fucking Undertale Reddit tier list where uh, Papyrus is just has his very own Minecraft YouTuber tier. I'm scrolling down through the comments to hopefully find, like, any context as to why Bing would think this is a, you know, appropriate fucking source. And the only thing I'm finding is the definition on what pedophilia is. Frankly, it shouldn't surprise me that the Venn diagram between Redditors, Undertale fans, and anime enjoyers is just a circle, but... Elden Ring. Uh, now, of course, you may be curious as to the other route-exclusive encounters in Genocide. Well, I mean, there's hard mode too, I guess, but uh, that'll be coming later. M maybe. Don't, don't count on it. Anyways, despite what you would probably expect, actually, probably the contrary, I've kind of been hinting at this the entire video, but the Genocide Route only gains one potential new addition with Sans, and in all honesty, I'm gonna give the dude a pass since he's the only thing stopping you from destroying the entire world, so in my humble opinion, getting dunked on is a viable war tactic. As for everything else, there's only subtractions with lots of enemies that will no longer attack you. Papyrus now no longer deploys any traps, but also gives you an opportunity to spare him that is completely unconditional. No need to battle him or repeatedly go to the cool shed to tire him out. Just spare him and the confrontation is over. All is well. Same thing occurs with the Mad Dummy, who turns into the Glad Dummy that you can instantly spare and proceed without conflict. Alternatively, you can just kill him in one hit, since he no longer has a boss battle anymore. Actually, on that note, he's not the only boss you can just skip by killing instantly. Of course, there's Metaton and Asgore, which don't even have attacks. On one hand, I know it's the entire point. On the other hand, I think Neo's theme goes in way too fucking hard to just be a pushover fight you kill in one hit. On a similar note, technically Muffet and Toriel's fights are still doable on the genocide route, as the fights will continue as normal if you don't attempt to kill them. But just like all the other bosses I mentioned, they still die in one hit, which at the very least, likely results in the fight ending before any crimes are committed. Also, Omega Flowey and Azrael by proxy aren't really around anymore by the virtue of fucking killing them, and the vast majority of the encounter pool are now justified in their attempt to kill you because you are a massive threat. In the genocide route, you are the war criminal. And I think that's pretty neat. However, I don't really know how or why, but when I alt f 4 the game because I didn't want to deal with the consequences of my own actions at the end, a la having the entire world destroyed by my very own creation, this happened. I don't know why, I don't really know how, but it appears everyone is happy. So, fuck it. I'm happy too. Not with the game, but with this video. I don't want to elaborate on the ethics of selling your soul. I don't want to elaborate on the ethics of the soulless pacifist route. I don't want to elaborate on the neutral route and the potentially awful things you can do there. 
or even further elaborate the genocide route in the extremely awful things you can do there. Just let me be free. I've, I've done enough. After a quick word from this video's actual sponsor, you guys. Yeah, I was considering putting this after that raid fake out, but I decided to put it here. If you like my content for whatever godforsaken reason, and you want to support me directly, I have a Patreon that you can access with the links in the description. Likewise, there's supers and the YouTube members tab that you can access with that nifty little join button under the title, assuming YouTube doesn't break and decide it needs another UI redesign for whatever godforsaken reason. With that said, thank you for everything. Like, sincerely, I say this a lot, but you choosing to watch this video helps me out a lot more than you would probably expect, even if you don't do all those annoying button presses that those terrible green screens tell you to do. That being said, an extra parasocial thank you to Seth Yarder 201, Corkatek, HKS Hornet, Lungulus, Xavbeat03, Blahaj Enthusiast, Frank, Hannah K, Dok Dog, and on one, Al Diaz, Wumpus, Sam B, Zach M, Scremio, Teachy Boy, Darkling, <laughs> Darkling, Darling Mim, Just a Plaid Shirt, Dan, Black Jade, Jacob S, Michael P, Breadman, Catapult Man One, Chair, Judge and Jury, Teddy Pear Guy, <laughs> Teddy Pear. We're doing this in one take. Uh, Minister of Sauces, Mr. Bones, Pyre Musical, No Goat, Vegeta, and Blazeheart. I can't begin to thank you enough for choosing to support me, of all people. Uh, anyways, that was the video, I guess. If you enjoyed it, thank you. Glad you liked it.